Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Before the break, we had the privilege to listen to absolute legend of the field, and now we have one more legend for you for another brainstorm session. Now, as we head on to the fifth technical session, I would like to call Dr. Bhatia to introduce our speaker. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Shivani. So it is again a great privilege for me to introduce uh, Dr. Ravindra Agrawal, who is my senior, my mentor, and he is the one who, who uh, you can say, inculcate the uh, uh, research kind of he is the one uh, I can see that uh, he's a role model kind of person for me. So uh, he, he is a uh, uh, person uh, uh, Dr. Katar is mentioning in the morning session that he was my first student, like the first student of Dr. P. Katar, his first PhD student, and he is the one who started the translational research uh, in our research group. He is the one who started and uh, deliver stories from into the Indian and international market. So with these few words, uh, I would like to say something that he is a, he, uh, Dr. Ravindra Tilwa has completed his M from a PhD, a PhD from Punjab University, and he has two US patent and 30 ECT uh, patent applications to his credit. He has a dozen of applications to his credit, pharmaceutical research profession. Uh, yeah, well expanded with the complete product development, regulatory filing, and commercial launch for the advanced market. He's uh, leading a group of uh, more than 25 years uh, in the area of formulation development. Uh, he's working on the development of a global genetic formulation at PAT for US, Europe, Australia, Canada, Brazil, Russia. Uh, uh, South Africa and other emerging markets. Uh, he's currently working as a vice president for the development development research team uh, at McLeod Pharmaceutical Limited, Mumbai, Maharashtra. Uh, before joining this, he was working with uh, some pharmaceutical industry for, uh, industry at Google as a senior general manager, and before that, uh, ran back to uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, he has around 15 END products to his credit. Um, three ND, which is a ND taking ND, is a big challenge. So he has three ND products to his credit. Additionally, he has around 100 filing for emerging market. He has received three prestigious awards during his PhD and uh, of course after the completing his PhD also won. Few of them are prestigious for the Bhutan Vidya Dandia Prize. Uh, international travel camp, he is, uh, is one of the cricket has been awarded as the best cricket by IAMS. And uh, with these few words, uh, let's uh, see the, the pharmaceutical research from the eye of any industrial expert who is in the industry thinks more than a, uh, you can say, 20. Uh, Two decades we've been to pharmaceutical media. Let's see what, what is there uh, from the perspectives of the industry with respect to pharmaceutical research. So, with these few words, uh, sir, uh, the, the session is over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Thank you so much for such a nice introduction. Yes, sir. So, can I see my presentation? Uh, sir, you, you have shared that presentation. You have to do it again, sir. Okay, so share screen. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Yes, now it's fine. Okay, thank thank you, Dr. Mith. So we will we'll start the presentation. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you, audience, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. 
I will go through some of the brief applications for the nanotechnology in pharmaceutical field and uh, uh, more of the case studies rather than going on the theoretical part because most of the things uh, academia is more doing on nanotechnology as compared to the industry. So uh, since it is my one of the favorite field for the research, so I am more inclined in nanotechnology as compared to the normal conventional products which we, we do in industry. So this is the uh, future world where, where we see that nanotechnology is one of the field which will be like most wanted field in the pharmaceutical field and we know there are a lot many things which uh, once you attach the drug molecules to these technologies the the advantage is enormous so we will go through the presentations and then we can take up the questions if any at the end of the session so uh, the content wise uh, it is just brief introduction of nanotechnology and it includes nanocrystal technology then smets liposomes pro liposomes albumin bound nanoparticles some basic equipments required for that and then regulatory aspects so what is nanotechnology so if we see the definition the study of nanoparticle or nano nano is something which is a greek word derived from the dwarf so it is actually science related to the particles which are in the range of 1 to 100 nanometers so uh, if we see in the range of 1 to 100 nanometers there are a lot of delivery systems which comes into picture micelles liposomes dendrimers then different polymers which are used for the nanoparticles so this is just a brief what is nano now why we want nanotechnology so why nanotechnology is required or why nanotechnology is a field which is of more emphasis nowadays or from uh, maybe say we can say last decade because it improves the drug potency and efficacy uh, through different routes of administration so basically we improve the drug potency as well as the efficacy of the problems and there are many drugs which are water insoluble poorly absorbable so uh, th these technology enhance the drug absorption so there is a commercial product for phenofibrate where dose is reduced by the nanonization similarly the nanoparticle bound particle which is abrexin in the market which reduces the toxicity of conventional paclitaxel and uh, the cardiotoxicity is reduced of doxorubicin by encapsulating the doxorubicin into the liposome and it is marketed with the trade name doxil so nanoparticles are useful for effective targeting they prevent the drug from biological degradation they decrease the fed and fasted variability they decrease patient to patient variability and we also found that the dose is significantly reduced if we use the nanotechnology so we will start with first concept that is nanocrystal so what is nanocrystal nanocrystal is just a wet milling concept where the drug particles are milled by the wet media milling to a nano range so if larger ap particles they have the lesser dissolution and faster transit time so if if we if these are nanonized then the dissolution time is uh, lesser than the GI transit time. So uh, the smaller particles because of the higher surface area and small particle size, the GI transit time, the dissolution is significantly increased. The wet milling process is a fast process. It eliminates the use of organic solvents. There is no polymorphic change in the API and the process is scalable. So it is of most use in the industry as a concept to minimize the uh, use of solvents and to use this technology as the preferred means of increasing the bioavailability and the dose reduction so we will go more details into this field these are some of the products which are uh, developed using nanoparticle technology so uh, this is the uh, available in the domain these products like Phenofibrate, Gryzeofalvin, Apripitent, Magistrol Acetate. So these are some of the drugs which have been 
made bioavailable by use of nanotechnology. Otherwise, they have very lesser absorption and lesser bioavailability. So uh, we'll go with one case study which we have done in our industry. So it is a topical anti-infective cream. We have used the API, which is by use of dynomil, it is denonized. And this size reduction of these particles, like you can see in the table, the D90 before micronization was 20 to 22 micron. And when it is micronized, it was less than 0.5 micron. So it is a significant change in terms of uh, reduction in particle size. And the average particle size is approximately reduced by the 30 times. And for surface area, if we see the 1.5 to 2 meter square of surface area become 80 to 90 meter square per gram. So the surface area is increased by 50 fold. So by use of dynomil, we could able to decrease the particle, style, particle size to such an extent that it becomes in a nano range. This is the equipment in the photograph which is used for the nanonization. So this cream formulation which contains nanonized API, it has been studied for different concentration to titrate the dose. And these, uh, the, the different doses are compared with the 1% commercial product which is available in the market. So 1% product contains the micronized API because drug is highly insoluble. So there are a lot many studies done on these formulations. These includes some in vitro studies on cell lines where the MIC st uh, study is done at the different concentration range of the product. Then in vivo studies, which includes the efficacy study on Swiss albinomice and Sprague Dolly rates. Then PK studies on Sprague Dolly rates. And then dermal toxicity studies also done on Vistar Hanover rates and uh, the, the inference was these formulations were well tolerated up to 100 mg per kg per day. It means up to 10% of the formulation, uh, the dose in the formulation. So do, though we are using at 1% concentration, but up to 10% the dose was tolerable and there was no toxicity and it was like no histopathological changes were noticed. API exposure shown that the dose is, uh, the dose is increasing, uh, that, that efficacy is showing by increasing dose. No systemic toxicity has been observed. And when we have done the clinical study, that is the phase three study, where the study was done on 251 subjects, where both the creams like topical nano cream at 0.5% level and marketed cream at 1% level were dosed. It was observed that topical cream containing nanonized API of 0.5% appears to be as effective and safe as 1% marketed formulation. So the dose is reduced by half and the efficacy remains same. So we'll discuss about the uh, concept like it is a machine which is known as dyno mill. It contains agitator bead mill with a horizontal grinding container. And it is suitable for all kinds of products, like from low viscosity to high viscosity, all kinds of products can be uh, milled into this dyno mill. External, external pump is used to feed the product into the dyno mill. And uh, this is the schematic of wet. Uh, bead milling process wherein if, if we say the, the product is milled with these chambers, these are the grinding chambers with the zirconium beads. The, so grinding beads are used of zirconium, stainless steel or highly cross-linked polymers and uh, zirconium, stainless steel or a highly cross-linked polystyrene resin coated polymer. The bead size used is from 0.15 to 3 mm. The dynamic gap separator or a special slot screen is used so that bead should not come along with the product. The milling time for the dyno milling, it depends on the solid content of the product, the viscosity of the product, hardness of the uh, API particles, the viscosity of the product, temperature, energy input. So these are the factors which, which decides the how much milling time or how much milling cycle the product will take to get the desired particle size.
drug concentration in the suspension can be of 5 to 40 percent so in this range we can use the dynomill for the nano milling stabilizers such as polymers are used in the concentration of 1 to 10 percent and surfactants are used in the concentration less than 1 percent the temperature inside the mill can be controlled by the circulating outer jacket where we can coolant can be circulated and the uh, product can be kept as a controlled temperature. So now we go with the challenges which are there in the nanonization through wet milling. So once we have the particles which are in the nano range, they have a higher surface area and because of higher surface area, area there is a lot of energy into these particles. So these highly energetic particles, they sometimes become form the clusters and these coalesces and form the bigger particles. So this, this phenomena is known as Ostwald ripening and uh, the resolution of this kind of problem is we have to use the stabilizers like hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, HPMC, polyvinyl pyrrolidone, PVP, hydroxypropyl cellulose, HPC, methyl cellulose, hydroxythyl cellulose and some surfactants are also used for these problems so have the better wetting property as well as minimize the charge so sodium lauryl sulfate dioctyl sodium sulfosuccinate polysorbates vitamin e tocopherol succinate this surfactant should not be used above cmc so that is the caution we need to take care during our so that's why we as a fundamentally we take one percent or less than one percent concentration of surfactant now coming to uh, some other challenges with respect to regulatory filings so in wet milling there may be some contamination which can happen due to beads wear so fda normally asks that have you checked the level of contaminant due to the beads wear and tear in the milling chamber and how you quantify that contamination so the resolution for these kind of thing is use of wear resistant polymers or where the minimum wear happened like yttrium stabilized zirconium or highly cross-linked polystyrene and then size of bead is also important to minimize the contamination further there are other parameters like agitation speed viscosity concentration of dispersion concentration of stabilizer, temperature of the coolant and number of cycles and we should have to develop analytical methods or suitable analytical techniques to determine the contaminants at the PPM level. So this is the most uh, expected queries come from the regulatory agencies. Now with respect to characterization of these particles, the particle size is one parameter which we determine through dynamic light scattering, SEM, TEM or atomic force microscopy. Then Gita potential by the Malvan Gita sizer. And in these also in these techniques where we determine the particle size, there are sometimes challenges in terms of determining the right particle size. So uh, the critical part in laser diffraction is like sample preparation. It should be homogeneous as sample so sonication may be required or maybe dilution may be required in the samples so the criteria is obscuration should be below five percent and if there are any artifacts then the method has to be optimized with the different concentration of samples to get the right particle size now uh, we come to the next case study where self microemulsive and drug delivery systems are used as a nanoparticles for the del drug delivery forms and these fo these pro these formulations are actually isotropic mixtures of oil surfactant co-surfactant and drug so this contains mainly four component oil surfactant co-surfactant and drug so if we give the normal drug in a so organic solvent and when it is ab uh, administered in the oral cavity it precipitates when it becomes diluted so in case of self microemulsive and drug delivery systems this does not allow the drug to be precipitated so drug is in the form of smets in the stomach so that is how the drug crystallization is prevented by use of this technology and it forms the 
oil in water emulsion and in, in situ in the body and becomes highly bioavailable. The process is uh, we dissolve the oil surfactant, co-surfactant and drug and then if we add water it becomes for the formation of smear suckers and these smears are like very useful in terms of decreasing the variability, biological variability into the system. They decrease the variability, they enhance the bioavailability, they decrease the food effect, there is no influence of lipid digestion process and the process is easily scalable. So that is the prime importance in the industry that we, we look for a process which is most scalable process in terms of uh, reproducing the batches, in terms of making different batches with same same quality. So consistency of the batches is important. This is uh, one drug which is used as a case study and it is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor with a low P of 4.5. It is a BCS class 2 drug having solubility of less than 0 0.01 mg per ml in the water. So in SCL also it has a solubility of 0 0.01 mg per ml. So why SMATs are prepared for such kind of drug? Because the drug is practically insoluble. The drug has a solubility dependent bioavailability. It has a variable bioavailability and it has a food effect. And as a SMATs, you give a patent term extension in terms of new doses form. So these are some of the criteria. That's why SMATs are proposed for these kind of drugs. Now coming to the next case study, it is a amphotericin B liposomes, which was prepared in line with the innovator Gilead for the MB some. And uh, when it was made in our lab, it is just a polarized light microscopic pictures of that, where the average particle size came around 1.2 micron. And when we were looking at the polarized microscope, the yellow color lamella is observed in the multilamellar structures, which shows that these bioreferences are due to the amphotericin B. So alone amphotericin is showing the these yellow crystals, which is uh, the drug color. And uh, when we see in the liposomes, the crystalline part is not there. So drug is intercalated into the lipid bilayers and become actually soluble kind of thing in the bilayers. The preparation flow chart is drug and lipid is dissolved in the organic solvent. Then the, the, this, this process is actually by spray drying. So in the presence of a, a nitrogen, the spray drying has been done. Then hydration was done with the aqueous buffer. Particle size was reduced by extruder and the product is then lyophilized. Now we come to the next case study. It is a pro-liposomes. Uh, this is also like uh, developed as a means to produce these kind of drugs into the industry where liposome has some challenges with respect to stability part and uh, with respect to ease of administration. So this was made for one of the oral drugs. Uh, for the oral delivery, the pro-liposomes as a concept was used and as we know that uh, some of the drugs which are taken up by the hepatic system and show first pass effect, when we incorporated these drugs into the lipid or liposomes, they bypass this, uh, bypass the hepatic effect and they go into the lymphatic circulation because of the lipid and the chylomicrons available in the lymphatic system. So that was the aim behind the use of proliposomes for oral delivery. And these are made up of phospholipids. They increase the bioavailability. The objective was to de design the scalable way and dry phospholipid drug complex. So once it goes into aqueous environment, it forms the liposomes. And the process used was spray drying. So spray drying is a single step and easy to use method. The other part is we have modulated the release profile with the different select use of different excipients. So we'll go to this case study where one drug was used, which is of retinoid category and three formulations I have 
mentioned in the slide wherein we have where we have studied the impact of mannitol in one product the mannitol was not there in this second product mannitol was used as a different concentration of 100 mg and 50 mg otherwise more or less in all the three product the formulation of uh, hspc cholesterol dspg drug bha bst everything is same so when we studied the release profile of these three formulation we came to know that uh, by use of mannitol the drug profile has a significant impact so we'll go to next slide if we see this next slide the uh, the product which contains the lesser quantity of mannitol or half of the quantity of mannitol has shown the controlled release profile and the product which does not contain any quantity of mannitol was the immediate release kind of profile with a 93% in 60 minutes so the the concentration of mannitol has given us the different kind of release profile so we can match the profile with whatever available product or as per the desired profile as well as we can bypass the lymph uh, hepatic circulation and we can increase the bioavailability of product by use of liposomes as well as these can be administered orally so these are some of the thoughts behind study of this particular case study now we come to the case study 5 it is it is the abrexan technology wherein albumin bound nanoparticle nap technology was used in the product so we will we'll, uh, go through the innovator details of this the innovator contains the paclitaxel which is api surrounded by the albumin outer layer so albumin is the outer layer present and the drug is inside that and this this, this technology is named as nap technology the patent for this technology has been expired in 2013 this technology actually has overcome lot of side effects associated with the paclitaxel administration where in hypersensitivity reactions were very high for the paclitaxel and there was lot of adverse events happening due to paclitaxel the size of uh, formulation is 130 nanometer the cost of treatment is Sixteen hundred dollar per dose. It is tolerable in the concentration from two sixty mg per meter square for three weeks. So you can assume the cost for three weeks would be very high. The global sales is one point one billion in two thousand nineteen. The dose is two sixty milligram per meter square. It contains paclitaxel hundred mg and human serum albumin ninety mg. This is. the comparison of pk parameters of the conventional product which is cremophore based that can be administered as a tolerable dose up to 175 mg per per meter square only whereas the this nap technology can administer up to 260 mg per meter square so the tolerating dose is much higher for the abrexan as compared to the cremophore based formulation and if we see the c max or the maximum concentration achieved it is almost seven times that of the cremophore base so higher concentration can be given to the patient so it it increases the survival rate much more than the conventional product the auc is more or less similar the maximum tolerated dose is for this is 300 then elimination half life is similar for both the products clearance is higher for the abrexan and the response rate is almost double for abrexan as compared to the conventional product so we can clearly see that nanoparticle help us to increase the response rate for the patients uh, actually by uh, twice of the conventional product this is the brief process how it has been made it is the emulsion evaporation cross link method uh, to prepare the nap paclitaxel where in 100 mg of paclitaxel were dissolved in 10 ml of methylene chloride it is added drop drop wise and with mild homogenization into the aqueous phase which contains 90 mg albumin in the 1% solution so first we made a normal homogenizer we take we make the crude emulsion then high pressure homogenizer is used and at 1300 bar and with six cycles to form the nano emulsion 
this nano emulsion is then uh, uh, by use of rota vapor the organic solvent is evaporated and the concentrated up to the 4 ml this nano suspension is then lyophilized for 48 hours and the product becomes lyophilized product so that is how this technology uh, we can make the nap these are uh, just uh, names of equipments which we normally use to make the nanoparticles so these includes homogenizer ultrasonicator dyno mill spray milling a spray milling is like a spray dryer they contains the uh, very fine aperture and along with that there is a filter is used a steel filter is used which provides the micro droplets from the spray dryer then super critical fluid technology electro spray ultra centrifugation we know and nano filtration so these are some of the equipments which are used for the preparation of nano particles now we come to the regulatory challenges so this is one of the important thing for academia also in terms of when we develop the nano particles we should consider some specific safety considerations so these specific safety considerations are uh, actually uh, i attended one of the crs in us and uh, from the fda interactions we came to know many of these things so i have just summarized uh, the bullet points these are like uh, whether the nanoparticles are soluble nanoparticles or insoluble nanoparticles the idea behind that is whether the insoluble particles may reside in the in the in vivo tissues and become a cytotoxic to the human body so that's why we need to know whether these nanoparticles are soluble like albumin is a water soluble so paclitaxel when uh, goes into albumin nanoparticles it becomes soluble similarly whether the nanoparticles gain access to the tissue and cells so uh, the same like when we give the larger particles the access to tissue is same as that of nanoparticles or it is different so that is what the idea which fda wants that whether you are studying that or you are not studying that that it is larger particles because larger particles are bypassed by the system so these small particles which is up, which is not uh, readily uptake by the reticulo endothelial systems so whether they reside into the body they will uh, metabolize they will not metabolize so we have to give some proof of that study whether these nanoparticles accumulate in certain sites in the body and if they accumulate whether there is a certain specific or latent toxicity is due to that or it may be acute and this will be removed so that kind of study has to be given if we want the regulatory approval for such kind of products now the other point is can these nanoparticles if they have impact on cellular functions or tissue functions and if they have impact it is transient or permanent and whether the sponsor or the filer is able to detect that impact on the cellular or tissue functions how are these nanoparticles cleared from tissues and blood and can the company who is filing this product can adequately measure the clearance whether these are cleared from the tissues so these are the important points which as a regulatory if we file or if we want to administer our products or we want to approve for the commercial purpose we need to study these kind of regulatory challenges some more things which is related to ADME considerations like how this particle size affects the biodistribution of nanoparticles like where where, the, where the, this particle size have impact and what are the limitations like we are doing dissolutions we are doing some other in vitro studies so what is the limitation of these tests to predict the in vivo levels of that drug containing the nanoparticles and how we can evaluate these methods with respect to adequate part that whether these methods are adequate whether we are able to manage the measuring levels of nanoparticles in blood and tissue or they are below the measuring levels so limit of de detection is very important then distinction between the nanoparticles aggregates and free drug so we should know how much of free drug is there in the circulation and how much of the nanoparticle circulating so this is most of the uh, one of the prominent question asked by regulatory bodies that have you evaluated this 
the drug is in the free form or it is in the nanoparticle bound form so these are some of the regulatory things where we have to uh, study these things with respect to detection of a free drug and uh, encapsulated drug similarly accuracy of mass balance studies so how much of drug is administered and how much is eliminated and what is there inside the body so that kind of proof also we need to submit to the regulatory bodies if we want to have approval for nanoparticle based products so these this in brief i summarize my presentation and thank you for listening this and i can take up questions so thank you very much sir it was a very brief and uh, enlightening uh, discussion so uh, we have come across the uh, aspects uh, related to the industry uh, what they want and how how to approach those we uh, are and few question must be there uh, like i will i will read you of okay. uh, shivani pannu has asked Uh, that do you think nanotechnology is effective for covid 19 therapy if we find effective medication means in chasing uh, the medication if we work on nanotechnology and we develop some medicine so nanotechnology what would be the role of nanotechnology so uh, amit it is actually a very good question and it came to my mind also that how can the persons who are involved with these kind of technologies what they can contribute into this so uh, one of the thing which i was uh, looking at this is uh, the rem desivir which is uh, widely used in the uh, serious kind of patient in the covid treatment okay so this injection is based on uh, cyclodextrins okay so that if you see the dose is low i think uh -huh. it is 100 mg and uh -huh. the dextrin is used up to 6 grams oh so if we if we try to make some kind of delivery system with these nano technology uh, delivery based system so we can definitely decrease the load of these excipients as well as yeah the efficacy yes. Yes. we know that efficacy is certainly high with nano particle based systems Yes, but the excipient load is too high, and if yes, you see, yeah, <laughs> yeah there may be not many yes, things, but this is one so, of the case study which came to my mind. Okay. Uh, another Sorry, I I missed that. Some disturbance came. Can you repeat the question? So uh, basically, uh, he is asking what are the major challenges for successful commercialization of meds and snets by industry? What are the main uh, areas? Uh, if somebody is working in the uh, working on these areas, meds and snets, so what are the ma major challenges for its commercialization? i think he is asking if if we develop something in academia and how we can transfer that into the industry what can be Smet, the social points smets and snets both you right right so this is this is one of the technology which is very attractive in terms of scalability of the process because it, it is a simpler technology and the challenge comes with respect to the concentration of surfactant so if we, if we make the uh, use of surfactant which are biodegradable kind of surfactants and then in the lower concentrations if it is possible to make these without use of organic solvents these are definitely of high value oh. that, that's really because of the load of organic that we need to take care of yes 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 the completion of the process so another question is uh, from uh, jay uh, prakash 
and Raj. He's asking, may I know which liposome size is suitable for as well as food application? Sorry, I missed the last part. Uh, he's asking uh, what should be the size of the, if, it, uh, if somebody is working on liposome, what would be the Yeah, some disturbance is coming, Amit. As well as... Hello? Yeah, uh, in between your voice has... I missed that voice. Uh, basically, uh, the, Mr. Dharaj is asking uh, what should be the size of liposome if we need to have, have a pharmaceutical or food application with that. So it depends basically on uh, what kind of delivery systems we are targeting. So in foods and all, the si it is an oral system. So the, si the size should not matter. The composition of liposome should be such that, that if there is some issue with respect to hepatic systems, as I briefed in that particular pro-liposome yes. concept. Yes. So uh, there we will find good advantage. Like, the drug become highly bioavailable if it is taken up by the lymphatic system. So uh, that is the good area of working where uh, uh, because the oral delivery systems are not available for those systems where only injections are used. If we can make yes. delivery system by use of liposomes and try to find the oral route of administration. Okay. So that is one of the good area, but for uh, for food systems, I I don't have much of the experience. I can only say that lipids are as good as food products. So yes. yeah, so this is one of the good area where somebody can work on it. But the uh, what we can say yes. is the nutrients can be delivered. Of this is, yeah, benefit of this system has to be weighed because these are the expensive lipids so we need to know that what is the aim or what is the target yes. of our system yes uh, so another uh, question is from uh, pankaj ramadas uh, he is asking which method is used for determination of cell uh, cell inflammatories i think uh, yeah I, I may not be remembering that yes. method, it be done by our clinical uh, team Yes, but, that is the separate thing. I come back to him because this is the simple inflammatory methods when we were doing in the our labs. Yes. At Punjab University also we did these studies where we induced the inflammation and then we were measuring the... So these are the common methods we normally use for this, but I can come back on this. Yes, okay, sir. Uh, does SEDS have effect on digestive exam? They they have these effects. Okay, so, question from Neha Rawat. Yes, so SADs have that effect, but SMADs have lesser effects. So SMADs or SNADs have lesser effect because of size. So higher particles have that effect of digestive. Okay, okay. Sir, uh, I have one question. Suppose uh, somebody is working in academia and he, he wants to do some translational research work. Uh, can you give us four or five uh, steps how to convert uh, as you have done uh, earlier mm -hmm. also Why, how to four or five step in through which we can translate our uh, academic research into a commercial product uh, what can be the things we, we should yeah. keep in our mind yeah, Two, three steps yeah this is actually a very important and <laughs> i can say pertinent question for uh, academic research and all because uh, whatever research we do, it is of no use if, yes. if somebody is not uh, properly extending that further. Either somebody is working on same lines of that research, uh, once one student completes, the other will take up and do further research on that. Then we yes. can come to of some kind of conclusion on that. But if you ask me basic things before, uh, if we are starting some research, then we should keep in mind the first thing is patient. Okay. So uh, the first thought should come like to whom we are administering this drug, how it can be goes to that patient or how can it be useful for the somebody who can use this product. So if we take care of uh, that thing in our mind, we will use 
those excipients which are already approved or can be approved by the regulatory agencies or by the DCGI. So we have to at least have that kind of thought process in our mind that whatever we are using, it should be safe to consumption. This should be, uh, this should not have toxic effects. This should not, or some due diligence has to be done in that part. And then we, when we are making the process, we should understand that uh, today I am making five ml batch. Uh, tomorrow, if I will make five liter batch, can I make it? Scale up. Yes. So that kind of thought process is if we have in our mind and we can uh, have the consistency of our uh, formulation. Like I am making one batch today. I have a one diff one release profile, but on other, another day I will be getting different profile. So there, if I will not work on that formulation that I will get the same profile, I may not be able to get into the market any time. Although these are the basic things, but these yeah. are very important. If we if we take these things into consideration, some way, yes, we will be able to do something because these small changes makes a big difference in our life. Yes. If we, uh, the technology may be not very big, the thought process is important that I want to have this product for the patient use or the, for the clinical use. So that thought process will let you those steps wherein uh, like we will not miss something which is actually not administratable at all. So I have interacted a lot many students at NIPER also at one point of time. Okay. And they are like some of the excipients which they were using were not approved anywhere. Okay. So, uh, so these are some of the things where we need some due diligence also yes. that whether whatever I am using is biodegradable, whether it is not impacting our any in vivo toxins, that kind of literature, if we will do properly on our excipients, our product or our, our type of administrating uh, doses forms, that thought process, I think that is important. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, for your kind words and uh, uh, taking up all the questions raised by the participants. Mm -hmm. uh, and in recognition to your, uh, I, I would like to mention over here that Ravik uh, Vidrawal is currently shifting his uh, home from his uh, uh, the earlier place that is Gurgaon, Mumbai. But still, he has given us the opportunity and give his, given us the time. Uh, take him on the board of uh, RMPP. I'm, I'm really, really thankful, sir, for your uh, kind gesture. And and uh, for from our side, sir, this is a small gesture of uh, gratitude for you. And uh, we appreciate your effort, sir. This is a small token of certificate that we will uh, uh, send to you, to the post. And, and thank you very much, sir, for your time and your valuable presentation and discussion with our participants. Thank you, Amit. Thank you for such nice words. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, anybody, if you have different questions, you can let Amit know. We, I, I can yeah. get back to them. Yeah. So you, you can post your question. We, we can get back to you uh, whenever we have a time, and we will uh, communicate through email so that we can uh, add all the questions and then circulate to the concerned uh, speakers, and they will give the answer and we will get back. Okay, so, yeah. so thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you thank can you. leave, sir, once again. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amit, and thank you all the participants for patiently listening. And maybe you will be doing more research in, in terms of uh, nanotechnology as compared to industry. But uh, I just thought that I will give you through the practical aspects wherein you can take care of some of the things. So thank yes. you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.